Are you being blessed? Yes. Amen. All right. I want to be very, very simple. Every church, think about it this way, has a front door and a back door. People come in, but people can also go out. Make sense? We don't want them to go out. When they join your church and become a believer, they need to stay there and grow and grow and not move from church to church to church to church. Grady Wilson of the Billy Graham team, who was one of the men that disciple me, had a lady come up to him once and she said, oh, Dr. Wilson, would you please help me find the perfect church? And he looked at her and he said, lady, if I tell you where such a church is and you join it, it won't be perfect anymore. <laughs> now, there is no such thing as a perfect person or a perfect church. Everybody agree? Yes. We're growing together in the grace of God and we're all maturing and we all help each other, iron sharpening iron, Proverb 27, 17. Now, I wanna to talk to you about the front and back door. I received a phone call from one of America's very much loved pastors, one of the 50 largest churches in North America. His name was Ross Rhodes. And Ross and I were good friends. In fact, he married my wife and me many years ago. He's with the Lord today, he died last year. But when Ross called me about, I'd say 35 years ago, he said, Billy, we've got a backdoor problem at Calvary Church in Charlotte, North Carolina. He said, come to our church, please. He said, we are losing, now get this, 52% of our 765 new members last year we lost 52% of them in 12 months. Now, is that a problem or not? That's a huge problem. The music director said, oh, I, I think the people are leaving the church because the music's not contemporary enough and they don't like the new organ. Okay. The minister of education thought people are leaving because the Sunday school, which is their small group ministry, uh, we don't have enough room at the church building and we're having to shuttle people in buses to another facility that's up two blocks away and they don't like that. Okay, everybody had some reason. And the pastor, Ross Rhodes, who is a terrific, oh my goodness, what a preacher. And he said, I just don't think my sermons are good enough. That's why 52% are leaving. I said, no, none of that's correct, not one of you. Give me time. So I spent several days with the people, listened to their stories, researched their situation. And I got back with Ross. And I said, Ross, your people do not feel loved. Now let me say this again. Your new members do not feel loved. He said, but we sing sweet, sweet spirit and hold hands at the end of the services. I said, Ross, that in love, that may be inspirational and it's certainly friendly, but love is much deeper than that. You need to have some people trained to actually walk with them and love them in Christ and disciple them on a one-to-one -one basis. He said, can you train them to do it? I said, sure. Give me one Saturday, we'll get it done, just like we're doing today. He said, do it. So we did it. We took, we took it by age groups. We needed young people to disciple young people. You with me now? They speak the same language. We needed ladies to disciple ladies. Now y'all, this is a Texas joke, so be, you just do me a favor and laugh, even if you don't think it's funny. All right. Any man that tells you he understands women will lie about other things as well, okay? Now, ladies understand ladies way better than we men do. Would you ladies agree? That's true. And men understand 
the challenges, the opportunities. They understand men. And that's why you see uh, the New Testament approach being so effective that way. Secondly, you don't need a man spending a whole lot of time with a woman that's not a wife. Couldn't get into trouble. Y'all agree? Okay. So for all of these reasons, men disciple men, ladies disciple ladies. He said, okay, Billy, what do we recruit? I said, well, let's take a look at your membership. We needed, uh, I think 56% of their membership was female. So we got more ladies that we invited to be trained on Saturday than men, and it worked fine. So we got 190 that were trained in that church, because a very large church, and they were assigned, now listen to that word, pastors, every pastor listen, you need someone in your church who is good at administration. They're gifted with government, governments. They can administer. And when people accept Christ, however you do it in your fellowship, and they identify themselves as being a new member or a new believer, notice, they may already be a believer but not have been discipled in the last church where they were a member. And they join your church when they move to your community. Great. Disciple them. Also, if they're a new believer, they definitely need to be discipled. Doesn't matter. Either one. Now, how do we do it? If you know that the person has a sport or a hobby that means a lot uh, to them, and you find out that they love whatever sport or hobby is big here in the Philippines, I really don't know how to talk about it intelligently here. But in, in the United States, it would be football, baseball, basketball, golf, bowling. It's gonna be something, fishing. It's gonna be something casual, an activity that they like to do. If you have 10 people to choose to disciple them, pick someone who has something in common with them. If, they, if the new believer that's coming in or the new member has been through a divorce recently or financial bankruptcy, a tragedy, or they've had a child killed in an accident, I could just keep going. Something that has made a huge impact on them or they're a recovering alcoholic. You want to take the person in your church who's equipped to be a disciple maker and put them together so that the older brother and sister can, in Christ's love, minister to that new believer and help them grow and feel important and part of the church. Get it? All right. Take the principle. Now, you feel loved through a personal relationship, not through holding hands and singing sweet, sweet spirit. No, you need somebody to get involved with you as a new believer and walk with you and understand your situation. And if time would allow me, which it won't, I would tell you oof, many stories about this and how it works. But love is simple, it's pure, it's kind, and that's what discipling is all about, is a Christ-centered friendship. Do you think that Jesus understood the hearts of his men? Sure he did. Do you think Paul, when he wrote Timothy and said, you have timidity as a problem and fear, but God has given a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind? Did he know what Timothy's problem was? Sure, because he was an adopted son, spiritually speaking. Okay, now, how do you do this in a local church effectively? I want you to think of a fire, a bonfire, just for a moment. The more kindling that you have when you light that fire, the more likely the fire is to grow and continue. You can lose a fire if you don't put enough kindling on it. Okay? Same is true with disciple making. You need enough people doing it in your church that it becomes part of the DNA of the way your church operates. 
The big church that I'm telling you about in Charlotte, North Carolina, was losing 52% of its new members in 12 months. After they did this with 190 disciple makers, those who were trained and disciple for about nine months, they became disciple makers. Did you hear that? Multiplication. And so it got up to 400 disciple makers that were working in the church, one-on-one with new members over a two-year period. It just grew and grew and grew. And they had a lady by the name of Naomi that would call all week long. All she did all day long was call the disciple makers, all 400 of them, so she could give a report to Ross Rhodes, the pastor, on Friday of every week. How are the new believers and the new members coming? So he got a report every Friday on the progress that was being made. He called me. I'll never forget the phone call. I was seated in Texas. He was in North Carolina. He said, Billy, are you sitting down? I said, yes, sir. He said, I want you to know that in 24 months, doing, becoming a disciple maker, same thing we're asking you to do. He said, we are now, you have to die to get out of this church. I said, what do you mean? He said, we have gone to a 2% attrition factor where it was 52% only 24 months ago. Now, if that doesn't excite you, I don't know how to get you excited. All right. Our churches need to open our front doors wider and close the back door through love, where people feel important. They feel part of the family. They are being equipped for their part of the Great Commission. Ladies with ladies, men with men. I have four more minutes. Okay, hang with me. I want you to hear one other. Five weeks ago, I was preaching at a conference in the United States with Robert Coleman, and they had a young pastor between us. And he got up for 10 minutes to give a testimony. You're going to love this. His church was about 190 years old. That's an old church. All right. It was out of Mobile, Alabama on 85 acres. Rural church plateaued for years, dying basically. And he learned uh, becoming a disciple maker in seminary. Uh, from one of the adjunct professors who came in and taught it for credit for a semester. He did it in his church that had 137 members, and he started it six years ago. He stood up and gave his testimony. You're not going to believe this. They have baptized 900 new believers in the six years. Yeah, in a church with 137 members. They're now running 750 in worship on a normal Sunday, 10 miles from town on 85 acres in a small rural church. It's just unheard of. And he had 50 churches in the last 60 days, he he called me and told me, that have called their church and said, what in the world are you doing? We want to do it. Teach us how. So they bought 50 sets of material and shipped them out to those churches and said, just follow the instructions. Pray and do it. Love will close the back door of a church and love will open the front door of a church. And the Lord said, you will know my disciples by their love. Let me tell you, if you don't love people, you will never do this. But if you do love people, oh my, the Philippines will never be the same. 